so you're sitting there down by the campfire. It's been such a crazy summer. And wow, so much has happened. And, you know, you and your best friends for the past few months are sitting next to the fire by the old lake. The cicadas are chirping. The flames are crackling in front of you. You're about to roast some marshmallows. And you all kind of, you can't help. You just want to reflect and look back on it all. And, you know, you, you, you decide to meditate a little bit and take it all in. Take in the wilderness, take in your youth, you know, summer camp memories. It's, it's hard not to feel all warm inside during these moments like these. So you sit down on the ground on your mat and right in front of the fire is the, the, the flames warm your face and you just shut your eyes and start to listen to the breeze and the sound of the water. With your eyes closed and after a deep breath, you start to reflect on the past seven weeks at camp and all the fun you've had, the friends you've made in the mess hall, the girls you kissed during Spin the Bottle, and you think what a truly, truly great time to be alive. Surely nothing can bring down this great moment you're having right now. Right now. You start picturing how good that s'more is going to taste when you put that marshmallow on the stick and stick it into the fire. And it's such a simple pleasure in life. A little chocolate, a little graham cracker, some marshmallow. You start to picture the, the, the smells and, and the taste of the, of, of the summer itself. And what's that? I think you, somebody's coming out of the water. It must be one of the counselors, but that can't shake you from this state of zen. Somebody's definitely coming out of the water, but nothing can shake you from the joy you feel at this moment, this literal fireside warmth. You're sitting there, just so warm by the fire. The wind's still blowing and you hear footsteps grow closer and you think, maybe it's my new friend Chuck. He's just uh, coming back from a swim. He's gonna sit next to me and close his eyes and we're all gonna experience this bliss together. Yeah, Chuck, Chuck will pick up on it. He gets what we're doing. I think I heard a middle of a growl thing. Maybe he's hungry, but that's okay. We have some wars. Chuck's kind of a hungry guy, but I think he'll appreciate the moment and not ruin it by, you know, saying too much. Yeah, we'll probably get it and sit down and just join us. But somebody has definitely come out of the water and come over to the fire. I think that much we can all agree on. But again, zen-like state. Nothing can shake this. Nothing can ruin this. With your eyes closed and you're feeling your whole body truly centered into a state of ultimate zen, you hear what sounds like in the distance a scream. And you slowly open your eyes and you see Chuck, or who you thought was Chuck, is actually the legend Swamp Monster has come out and he is ripping your counselor limb from limb, throwing his lifeless body into the fire. And you think to yourself, surely there will be no s'mores this evening. And you think, wow, I feel so relaxed, but... He just threw a grown man as if it were a rag doll. This swamp thing is real and it's very strong. My life is in immediate danger. I wish I weren't so f***ing calm right now. You peek open your eyes again to make sure it wasn't just a dream and you see the rest of your friends, your brand new best friends who you just made lifelong memories with are getting totally obliterated, blood pouring out of their ears and tossed around like rag dolls by this swamp monster who you were sure was just a scary bedtime story, but now you're experiencing it in real life. This is no tall tale. This is pure homicide right in front of you. And the thing about it is, though, kind of, that, like, this couldn't have come at a worse time, honestly, because I was just feeling so centered. You know what I mean? You feel really centered, and you're like, f***ing swamp monster, man. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to wait, like, another half hour when we started the s'mores or something. Like, we were just kind of, like, I've honestly never felt more centered, so this is kind of, <laughs> it's just not going to work for me the way this is happening. It's just kind of bumming me out. I'm starting to lose my zen a little bit. The blood is starting to drip onto my sneakers and things like that. Kind of the spray is affecting me at this point. So I'm kind of starting to snap out of it. It's just a f***ing bummer, man. <laughs> and when you finally release from your zen state, you realize, oh no, this is real danger. And you start to get up to try to run to safety. The swamp monster grabs you by the ankle and it slowly drags you back into the water. You realize that your death will actually be far worse than the ones you just experienced because 
Yeah, he's taking me alive. Oh my god. I'm, I'm not Zen. This is not Zen. He's taking me alive. He's. This is bad. This is bad. Kill me outside of the water. Oh god, he's dragging me in. He's dragging me deeper. Deep. Oh god, I can't. I'm starting to go black. Things are going black. I'm so centered. And as your whole world starts to fade to black as you drown underneath the water, uh, you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> What a magical summer. <laughs> There's your cruel summer. That's about how my... <laughs> All right, let's start the show. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what is going on, everybody? I'm Tom. And I'm Pat. We're best friends, and you're listening to the Reminiscent Podcast. <laughs> They say you can't choose your family, well you also can't choose which era of music you grew up in. This is a weekly show where we discuss our favorite bands from adolescence and how they continue to shape our lives today. Each week we'll head back to the early 2000s and take a closer look at the cards we were dealt. Welcome back. Hey, how are you man? I'm doing well, how about yourself? It's been a little while. It's It's been a long while, but uh, after that nice relaxation, I'm feeling good. It's been kind of a demanding day so far. So yeah, it feels good to be back into it, man. It's been since, God, the end of June. Yeah, it's been a while. A lot's happened. An awful lot's happened that we will talk about at the end of this episode, I do believe, but this is mainly a lover episode, right? Taylor Swift put out a new album just over 10 days ago or so. And uh, we've got some thoughts, right? A few. Yeah. Plenty's happened. We have plenty of thoughts. And uh, yeah, we're going to take a break from our regularly scheduled programming to talk about the new Swift record as is tradition. And uh, if you're just joining us for Swift purposes, hopefully we can keep you around. That's the goal. Uh, But guess what's been building up? You may not even believe it. If it even were to happen, but there's a bunch of mail. I have, I, I, this is a new apartment. I don't know how they keep, this is definitely a new address, but the mail has made it to Greensboro, North Carolina, where I currently reside. And uh, they're all addressed to you, oddly enough. So I don't know if you want me to, <laughs> Why do, should happening? I read? I don't know. Hey, they, the fans want what they want, man. The heart knows what it wants. Um, <laughs> that's not even a Taylor thing. Never mind. Um, but this first one comes from Alex in Alexandria. She wants to know, Dear Tom, does the road get harder and you get lost when you're led by blind faith? <laughs> in my experience, I think the road gets easier and I find my way when I uh, go by blind faith. I would recommend everyone follows their heart because as you previously stated, the heart does know what it wants. So the road does not get longer. No. Or harder. No, definitely not. Okay. This one comes from Jamie in Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. Tom, would you rather be a heartbreak prince or a garage band king? (laughs) Oh, man. That's a mashup there. Garage band king, for sure. I don't want to break hearts. But I guess if you're in a garage band, probably your heart is broken. So it depends on how selfish I want to feel that day. But I think... Probably Garage Band King. I think I think the folks at home enjoy how seriously you take this. It's almost like a reflection session, and uh, <laughs> you know, the honesty is definitely appreciated. <laughs> this one comes from Jess in Greenville, South Carolina. Would you say that you have the boyish looks that I like in a man? <laughs> um, I don't know if I'd be a good job. What do you think, Pat? Do I have the boyish looks that this stranger likes in a man? I don't know. Of the two of us, you do have a boyish charm to you, I got to say. I do. Uh, Man, that's... This is an oddly similar question from Dakota from, quote, the other Dakota. Is there <laughs> religion in your lips, and do you consider the altar to be your hips? So there's there's a good amount of... Um, these are all Taylor-related. I think people knew the episode was coming and, and wanted to get out ahead of this. Um, do you have a boyish altar set of altar hips? <laughs> Is really, I think, what the fans want are curious about. Do I have a boyish set of altar hips? 
<laughs> yes. That's <laughs> okay. In short, yes. I hope Dakota and uh, and uh, Alex. I hope that's what you were looking for there. Here, this one seems to be the normal one. Okay. Here's a, here's a pretty regular question. Here it looks like this one comes from. Oh, there's no return address actually. Uh, hey Tom, how was your summer? Any adventures? Any sunburns? I know how you hate those. LOL. Uh, any sunburns on your feet? How are your feet? Can I have some pictures of your feet? <laughs> well, <laughs> I sure started off normal. Holy hell. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, a couple vacations. I was in several sunny spots. I was in California at the end of June. And then I was in Florida mid-August for my sister's birthday and a podcast conference, respectively. I have been inside for the past, oh gosh, since the day I went self-employed. No sunburns. I'm happy to report. I stay covered. I put on my sun bum because it smells the best and stay out of the sun as What's much as I can. Bum? Huh? What's a sun bum? It is uh, that, uh, what is it? Sunblock that has like the coconut um, looking front with the yellow caps our friend alexis i think got like sponsored by them for being like a cute girl on instagram <laughs> oh yeah so that's pretty cool but yeah it, it in my opinion it's the best and best smelling sunblock out there so no sunburns i have been in the er multiple times with second degree sunburns and i will spend the rest of my life avoiding that situation feet are okay uh picture in the show notes as always for for sure. and all. not even a patreon thing this is just the type of love we give <laughs> we just merely ask that you uh tap the subscribe button for the feet it's really <laughs> if you're, we're getting you there with the feet and all we can ask is that you, you give us a little something something back <laughs> all right is that it not my feet it's always tom i appreciate yeah. the sacrifice for the show i mean I, I don't think i would ever do that but i appreciate that you are and giving the people what they want of course <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I was mostly wanted to, we're breaking it back in a little bit. It's been a few months away. Uh, we've chatted a little bit, but we haven't really talked too much, honestly, between the two of us. Um, I wondered if there was any specific way, uh, we got through a little bit of mail catching things up. Uh, I think you have a set of boyish ships personally, um, <laughs> in a good way. And mostly I want to say that, do we want to do best chorus? underappreciated tracks overall review uh what are you thinking i kind of just wrote down like initial thoughts the standout parts of the standout tracks and then okay. and then a quick give me the wrap initial up. thoughts yeah hit me hit me with them what do you think this is lover definitely different from reputation obviously just in colors of alone <laughs> what, what are we feeling what's the vibe yeah, I think the intention was polar opposite of reputation and my initial thought. So I actually filmed and live streamed myself listening to the album in its entirety for the first time with headphones on. There's no sound. It's just me listening to the album. So if there's enough interest, maybe I'll throw that on our YouTube channel so you can actually see my initial thoughts in real time. But, but only your thoughts. Not only my thoughts. Ex not externally, internally, you having the thoughts. Right. <laughs> Gotcha. <laughs> Which is an excellent use of Facebook Live. That's definitely what Zuck had in mind when uh, the feature was created, I think. <laughs> so my first thought was, the first song makes an allusion to reputation. And it's about not caring about how someone feels about her and her reputation. And first of all, I love the song. I forgot that you existed. I think it's so catchy. I think it's a great album opener. But my very, very, very first thought was, what the f*** is going on with this? Because when Reputation came out, the whole pre-launch thing was like, I'm a badass chick. I don't care what you think. I'm going to be myself. And then half the songs were love songs about Joe. And I was like, okay, so the the launch felt a little misguided, maybe misrepresented the album. And then this whole album is like, this whole thing is about how I'm in love with Joe. And then the first song is about her reputation. And I'm just like, what is going on here? <laughs> like, it felt so confusing. Okay, so I think we both saw the Rolling Stone review that said, well, they said it in a favorable way, but it, it, it hinted that it might have been a little scatterbrained. Did you feel that was the that was the case? Like it didn't couldn't didn't quite. She wasn't always at her best throughout. Like it was, a, there was a little all over the place tone. I don't know if tone's the right word, but um, there's some 
you know, stand up based country stuff. There's some dancey stuff. There, like, how did you feel about? They they made it seem like it was she was writing all of her best versions of her former hits, kind of and like kind of a mashup thing. But I don't know if that was. Do you think that worked to the album's favor or not? Or what do you think about all that? Yeah, so that actually goes in line with like my first like initial thought that I wrote down in our show notes here is that somehow it managed to feel like the least Taylor Swift album and the most Taylor Swift album at the same time. And I think a lot of that is because I think scatterbrained is like an okay word for that, but it was also representing, it seemed like every past album and there were really strong nods to all the past albums in lyrics and themes as well. I think I would have shuffled around the songs a little bit in terms of its order. I probably would get, uh, I don't know. Are there too many songs? I, I feel still, even after almost two weeks with the album, overwhelmed digging into it because it is so much to process. Like, I had to listen to the album, like, the first half the first week and then the second half the second week. It's a lot, dude. I mean, it's an hour, 18 songs. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> I wouldn't say too much because, like, who would say I want less Taylor Swift? But it's a lot. I do feel like it could have easily been a more focused 13 song album, but I guess I wouldn't wish for that. I would just make a playlist on my phone and put those songs in there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think I went through two or three times, took the tracks that I was starting to like and made a playlist out of those so I could kind of analyze those a little better and deeper so I could at least become very familiar with you know, the tracks throughout the album before kind of like, um, I mean, the Archer, we had heard, we had had months with the Archer. So I didn't, you know, I kind of took that aside, things like that, you know, kind of trying to go through some of the newer releases and stuff. Um, do you think, well, this is a bonus mailbag question coming from me to you. Would you be drunk in the back of the car or crying like a baby coming home from the bar if you had to, if you had to pick? Slash Cruel Summer is my official first bop off the album. I think it's easily oh, yeah. the best track on yes. the entire record. I think it's what I'm getting at, but I do would like you to answer the question as well. Um. Well, <laughs> I would be neither <laughs> ever. <laughs> like, um, gotcha. I, I'd rather okay. be crying coming home from the bar, seeing as I've never been drunk. <laughs> but <laughs> I think me too. I think I'd rather be the one crying in the car. Oddly enough, you don't want to be in the back seat, just wrecking everybody's evening. You're probably the reason why. Um, <laughs> here's another quick question: Would you rather be Miss Americana or the Heartbreak Prince? And is that track one of the better or one of the worst uh, ones on the album for you personally? I think I'd rather be Miss Americana. <laughs> me too. We're reading each other's mind today, and I love it. Three months later, and we haven't lost a damn step. <laughs> But do you like it? I, 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 that one grew on me a little bit. I, I like it, but I, I, you know, I think we didn't agree on all of our favorites right away, necessarily. You know, you can actually see my face when I was listening to the song for the first time. I could not wait for it to be over. <laughs> the yelling is a little jarring, but then the yelling in the background, the backup gang vocals kind of grew on me a little bit over time, I, I have to say. You mean the go, fight, yes, I, win. <laughs> wow, you are nailing the impression. of Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I think it had the really boring melodic style that I found most of reputation captured. And I just like, I just do not like this song. Like I don't, I don't hate it, but like, I really don't like it. And a lot, it stood out for a lot of people. A lot of people have that song in like their top three or five. Right. Well, it was mentioned as one of those, like if title track lover, which we'll talk about that in a second. Cause I, I think that, I will go over our top three songs of the record, but um, it does have a little taste of, you know, the high school vibe. There were I saw people asking questions like, how long is you going to write songs about having crushes in high school, things like that? Do you have any problems with that? Or what? what how do you feel about the throwback stuff, lyrically throwback stuff? I don't know, man. I just don't think it fits on this record at all, and I just don't like it. Like, it feels... I don't know. I don't want to say underdeveloped or, like, immature... I just don't like it. I don't know. It's it, it, my least favorite song of the entire record for sure. Okay. And it goes back to like 
okay, I feel like I'm one of the only people in the world who didn't like Reputation. I feel like I'm one of the only people in the world who does not like the Beatles or Metallica or like whatever. <laughs> like not liking that song really made me question like is there something wrong with me where like everything i hate people seem to love and everything i love i get for like this song made me question my entire life right i well if we walk through it i don't know if it makes my top three upon further review i i guess i do want to give people some we've done we did a a review of the reputation tour movie on netflix we did a review of the tour of the album itself um and we did a release of the me music video episode. It's for those who are just joining us. Um, usually we do a throwback to the early 2000s music, right? That's kind of the show. Uh, but we're both fans of Taylor Swift and here we are. Um, I think we both agree that 1989 and Red are her, for lack of a, this is a very awful comparison, but her uh, enema of the state and take off your pants and jacket, if you yeah, will. Yeah, totally. Right? Totally. I think reputation's on a lower level. I think lover's still on the level of reputation, but I think where people have been caught up because kind of the body of work is kind of jarring, right? I mean, she's not even like we're already, we have so many albums just to sort through material wise that we're kind of so far removed from Fearless and some of those records that were really good for what they were, right? I mean, not even for what they were, just in general for like country pop, country, whatever, what have you. Um, it's kind of hard to keep them all straight, but I do think this doesn't reach the tier because you came out pretty quick and said this one was just fundamentally better than Reputation. But on the larger scope, I felt it definitely wasn't on the top tier, though. I felt it might have been on the same level close enough to Reputation quality-wise. I, I don't know if you thought, like, I would try to look at it like this in while we were taking notes about all this. How many songs in this album is she at her very best? And I think in 1989 in Red, there's a stupid amount of tracks where she's just unconscious ice in her veins just doing what she does right <laughs> i'm not sure this album has that level of goodness but people seem to like it so much faster and quicker than reputation right away which i think is why we waited to do a review this time because we kind of jumped the gun on reputation i think it grew on both of us after we had recorded that review but um i don't know what do you think like where where does this stand and how many of these tracks this kind of is leading to the what are your three favorite tracks and how do they hold up to her other work, things like that. But yeah, where does it land as a whole among her records for you? And what are your three favorite songs? And is she putting her best foot forward, et cetera? I'm rambling, but yeah, the 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 ball is yours, my man. I mean, I feel like I'm just having a hard time really connecting with it. And I don't think it has anything to do with the record itself. I think my mental state right now is just not in a place to accept emotion. And I feel like it's been that way for like a couple of years, but like I am growing a business, right? I'm super stressed about all that stuff. We're bringing the, the podcast back, which is like a lot of work, pretty stressful. We're going to put a lot more effort into that. I'm putting a lot more effort into video content for my business. So things are just kind of going in one ear and out the other. So I think that at no fault of the album or Taylor, I'm just not emotionally co like connecting with this album. I think that this winter, it's going to be a very important album for me. I think there's a lot of songs that I will connect to. I'm just struggling and I'm trying to like figure out if it's, my actual feelings on the album or just where I am in life right now. And there's also an element of, I was so into all the launch stuff. Like I was on the discord servers, the Taylor Swift discord, the subreddits reading every article. I bought every magazine I can get my hands on. And there was, you know, all the Easter eggs and Oh, a secret performance here and a pop-up shop there. Now I think I might be in this like sort of depression state where it's like, oh, here's the album, all the excitement is over. <laughs> like, and I feel guilty about that. But like, I I do think it's a great album. I think there's just too, there might be too much on it and it's a little disconnected. I'm kind of struggling a little bit. Um, and then there's some like production stuff that's bothering me and like I'm an audio editor. So like, there's like random like breaths that are like cut pretty quickly especially in the first track you'll notice 
it just kind of cuts halfway into her breath and shit like that is really, really bothering me and also making me like disassociate a little more from the emotion of the album, just hearing little quirks like that. Um, but I mean, that being said, there's a lot that I do love about the album. I think I'm just not in a place to accept it right now. Do you think that it was easier for people just to be vaguely in high school, her fan base that is roughly her same age while she was coming out with fearless and stuff. And then when red came around, have experienced a breakup. And then the more she part, like are the lyrics getting too specific? Is she a little boozier than you typically are on a day-to-day basis? Are, are the songs getting too ultra specific in terms of, you know, relationships as you get a little older and friendships and things like that? Like, uh, are you a little fearful that you would only grow further and further from what used to be pretty generally easy to um, associate with songs in terms of just dealing with relationships on a teen pop level? I mean, we we spoke about this in the past with like, do artists need to be tortured in order for them to make good art? And obviously this album is kind of coming from like a better place in life and I'm in a good place in life too. So I don't understand why it's hard for me, but I connect more to like soul crushing songs, you know? So there's a part of her older music that I think I just connect with more because I think just growing up on pop punk and emo, it's easier to like, Oh, her heart's being torn apart. Yeah. I'm into that. (laughs) Like you don't want them to be experiencing that, but like hearing a song about like, Oh, everything's fine. I'm in love with the London boy. While the song is super catchy, it's just like, I'm not like my soul isn't attaching itself to it or something. Right. Well, am I answering your questions at all? Like, (laughs) I am interested. I mean, you're giving your thoughts on the album, which is the point of the show. Um, Give me these. What did she get right? What are your three favorite songs in the album? Are any of them her firing on all cylinders? I honestly think. It's really interesting because I tend to notice the first three songs of an album, mainly because of how yellow card opens ocean Avenue with like the best run of three songs in the history of the universe. I think the first three songs on this album are maybe the three best songs on the album. Um, what's the number three? Oh, lover. Oh, the title track. I uh, yeah. I mean that that's a you could do a pod on that song alone. Do you want to take a minute to talk about that? I mean, do, is I don't know if it's the best on the record, but it's f- different and good. It's the slowest she's gone in a while. I mean, New Year's Day was slow on Reputation and stuff, but I mean, like, is "strip down" the right word or the right phrase to describe what it's that not, song is? It's not quite stripped down, but it's just kind of that like. Yeah, I mean, it's different. I'm I'm failing to find the right word. If you're listening to this, you know what it sounds like, but it's definitely a stand-up bass, I don't know, you know, just kind of acoustic, slower. It's a love song. It's a really sweet love song. Um, and it's probably one of the better ones on the record. I don't know. Well, give me your three first. That's the part you haven't answered yet. Give me your three and we can work from there. Yeah, I forgot that you existed, Cruel Summer and Lover, the first three on the album, I think are my fir- are my three favorite. But like... There's so many that I actually really, really like. Um, But yeah, I I think I forgot that you existed. Like it was the standout one on the first spin. I remember that one the most. It's got really interesting rhythm. I really like it. But the thing about it is it's it's like so weirdly amazing, but also so forgettable at the same time. Like I find myself forgetting something other than the chorus. I think some of the lyrics are like a little half baked, but like I dig it. Like I will listen to that song even after she releases five more albums. It's just super catchy. It's like a really fun carefree pop song. And I do like the phrase. It isn't love. It isn't hate. It's just indifference because I think the concept of indifference being the opposite of love rather than hate is interesting and obviously true. And I think I do kind of attach to that song a bit because I feel like my emotional state lately has just been years of indifference. (laughs) So there's, there's a lot of people that I used to have strong feelings about. Now it's just like, 
whatever. They're just a person that exists in the same universe that I do. So I really like the message of that song. What's your, uh, I'm, I'm going to go cruel summer is a certified banger. Just, yeah. I mean, that's God, oh, it's gotta be one of the best ones. I mean, lover is a good song, but I mean, she throws down. It's kind of like, um, like how ready for it came out of the gate. So ha- strong on reputation. I don't know. I, I wasn't as quick as you to say that reputation was instantly worse than lover, honestly, um, looking back at it, but, uh, cruel summer is, a, a wow, wowsy wowser for sure. Lovers so strong. Um, I like it's nice to have a friend. Um, I think that's probably rounds out my top three. Um, I wasn't sure if she was, you know, in her head writing about a boy or a girl in that song. I don't think it really matters, but it's a beautiful second to last song on a record. That's for sure. It's definitely one you'd hope to catch on the album or on a playlist while you're driving home from somewhere on like a road trip or something. Um, just a really sweet song, easy to listen to. Uh, I guess we haven't really talked about the two early releases yet that were supposed to be the quote-unquote singles. I think there's Ira Madison, or, or was it Ira Madison? Or uh, somebody tweeted that, uh, you know, other than the messy singles, it's a really sweet Taylor album. Uh, he was referencing me and um, You Need to Calm Down. Um, neither of us put those in our top three. Why do you think they were chosen as the singles? Why do you think they were problematic might be the wrong word, but people kind of instantly were scratching their heads about what this record was even going to look like. Because when Lover dropped, it was like, okay, I'm not quite sure at all what to expect. You know what I mean? I mean, Archer was not a throwaway because Jack Antonoff is great. I just don't really care for, you know, the song is kind of a meh, doesn't catch any headlines compared to some of the other tracks that got released. But I don't know. I mean, those songs are definitely not talked about as some of the better ones on the record at least not now that it's released, or I could be wrong. Am I wrong or right? Or what do you think about those two specifically? Because they got a lot of play. I mean, like, how did those get plucked? Are the, it, you know, were those people, did they spend more time producing those ones? Or, you know, I, what do you think? I mean, I think they were definitely written for the sake of capturing the most attention and the broadest audience, which I think is what they do very well. I, I love both me and you need to calm down, but it's funny. I keep forgetting that they exist because I'm so overwhelmed with the other 16 fucking songs. It's sometimes when it shows up on the album, I'm like, oh, is that on the same record? Because I feel like they've been out forever, probably because I've listened to them so much. Um, Yeah, I mean, to me, it just seems like it was the single for the attention and then the album is the actual focus which uh, was kind of her move with both shake it off on 1989 and look what you made me do with reputation like those were the ones that were clearly different than the rest and it's because those were for the general public And then the rest of the album is for the actual Taylor Swift fan. So I think it makes sense that they seem a little bit out of place in the album because they already served their purpose. But I like them. So here's a choose your own adventure. Do you want to talk about the song If I Were a Man? I don't know if that's the actual title track. Slash You Need to Calm Down. Kind of the... um, there was not pushback might be the wrong word about the video for you need to calm down, but there seems to be an, an element of wokeness on this record that wasn't on past records. We could ch- go down that path or, or we could choose to discuss or we could do both, honestly, or we could do a quick bonus mailbag question for me to you. I mean, I've got a lot more to say about the entire album. <laughs> oh, sh- I- well, I'll ask the question anyway. <laughs> Sure. Would you rather be the person asking the traffic lights if, if it'll be all right? Or would you rather be the traffic lights replying that I don't know? <laughs> I'll be the traffic light. <laughs> oh, shit. okay. So I'm, I'm gazing at you wondering if things are going to work out. Um, she had some interesting comments about that song, um, which I think, do you have an honorable mention song? I think that might be mine, Death by a Thousand Cuts. <sighs> I feel like I have seven honorable mentions. Give me with give me all seven. Let me rip through them. Yeah, give me yeah yeah yeah. 
All right, so for my top three, I agree. Cruel Summer is one of the best songs on the record. I think Lover might be one of Taylor's best songs of all time. I just, I love it. I think it's a fucking classic. I think yeah, he I don't knows. think that's a stretch to say that. Yeah. Okay, so honorable mentions. I think he knows, probably comes in a strong fourth place. I think her falsetto is kind of sexy. I really want to see this song live, and I love that it's like kind of funky. Um, that song makes me want to jam- dance to. Paper Rings is fun. It makes me think of like the old. Oh god! Reminds me of Stay 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 on Red a little bit. Just exactly just a very fun. Exactly. Movie. Yeah, it makes me think of that song a lot. Very like Red era. And my first impression, listen, listening to the song when she says, "I love shiny things, but I'd marry you with paper rings." I don't know if this was an intentional double meaning, but. I hear the phrase a lot in like the entrepreneur world, like shiny thing syndrome. And it's, you just want to chase like the newest shiny thing. So the first time I heard that, my thought process was I like shiny things, but I'd marry you thinking like, Oh, the hot new guy. I like shiny things, but I'd stick around with you. And then it occurred to me that like, oh no, shiny things could also mean like a ring, but she doesn't need like a diamond ring. She would marry him with a paper ring. And I just thought that double meaning crammed into such a small space was really interesting. And the song is just fun too. Cornelia Street. Again, I think something is just wrong with me and I can only relate to like extreme depression. (laughs) So... It's a good song. I feel like a lot of this album lacks a lot of low end in the mix. And I think this song kind of provides that. False God really caught my attention on the first spin. That would be my other honorable mention, I think. I feel like this song needs like a birth date verification. You know, like, are you 18 and older? (laughs) Like this song just feels like straight up pornography to me. And I love it. It is so sexy and not even like not in like a creepy like i want to bang taylor like that's not the thing it's just like the song is so sexy and i love it it's kind of like black dress from reputation well you need to pass a test to get a license to drive a vehicle you should probably pass a test before you use a a saxophone like that in your pop music (laughs) i mean you don't it's an important powerful tool that's for sure (laughs) it's just so good like it is maybe fought my fifth on this album bonus mailbag question yes were we crazy to think that this could work (laughs) this podcast after 140 episodes yeah (laughs) (laughs) all right two more london boy is catchy I like um, that it's just kind of like a fun banger. Not really a throwaway, but just fun. I think Cornelia Street is a throwaway. London Boy, blah. I forgot you they existed. Throwaway for me. I don't know. They're fine, but wow. I feel like we've heard the same version of all the... Like, I feel... Even Paper Rings, we already had Stay, Stay, Stay. Some of it, like like you were saying, you couldn't connect. I felt that a little bit in the sense that some of these songs, it's kind of like, you know, we've heard... S- something felt like I've heard this before a little bit. Cruel Summer felt like a little leftover of the vibiness of reputation with the dancey stuff, the boozy dancey stuff and the energy. But there was something about Cornelia Street and Paper Rings that didn't totally catch my eye, I guess. And London Boy, either it's the catchiest thing ever or it's just the laziest, dumbest thing. Not laziest, dumbest, but um, I don't know. There's something awkward about it. There's something not... I guess I had trouble connecting as well, and now it's coming to me now that you're saying some of these songs out loud. So this is what it makes me think of. This is why we can't have nice things from reputation where I didn't really appreciate that song until I saw the live performance during the reputation tour on Netflix, obviously, because I didn't couldn't afford to go at the time. I feel like I feel like if they do that live, it'll be a lot of fun and it's just going to be a fun dance number where they're, you know, like splashing around in the water, whatever. And daylight, I think, is beautiful. My favorite thing about it is a lot of these songs reference lyrics from older albums. And I love that she says in this song, I used to believe love would be burning red, which is obviously a a callback to the song red from the album red. And (laughs) I just, I love it. I think it's so good. Like it's so well. Sorry, I'm not laughing at your take. The the sentence itself, the word red was used a lot in it and it made me chuckle, but I was not in any way. (laughs) No, I just, you caught me. Or the mean girl saying, say, say red again. Red. <laughs> <laughs> All 
So the, I mean, those are all my like standout things from the standout songs. There's a lot that I do like about it. I think if you ask me in the winter, I will tell you that like this song is very, or this album is very important to me, but right now I'm glad it's here. I just like need to shelve it for a minute. Cause I have stuff to take care of. And then I can like really just lay in bed with the lights off and just like, absorb this album for all that it is yeah it's a little tricky i mean we've talked about this in past reviews but you know red was a breakup record that caught me when i needed a breakup record so it was almost like uh, an an unfair advantage among all the other you know i wasn't a teen girl during fearless's release or anything so right right. um like and you know that one we were attached at the hip right away for reasons that 1989 or reputation couldn't have helped i guess talking about you know, what do you think? How did you feel about the referencing Drake lyrics and the sh- shots like tequila and some of the? Um, I think there was a couple swings and misses in terms of stylistic things. I don't know. Did you catch any of that? You, you mentioned her sp- like talk singing a little bit on some of the tracks. Um, was there anything stylistically that just kind of bugged you? Not necessarily was it bad, but that you just noticed that were, you know, out of place a little bit? Kind of in that same vein of this was a scatterbrained effort overall. I do like that she's starting to just like swear more and just seems like she's being more authentically herself. Uh, she talks about drinking a lot, which makes me think like, is she okay? <laughs> you know? like, right. Well, God. you are a, a non-drinker, um, as you've mentioned on the show, and you you mentioned that that kept you at a distance from some of the songs, kind of naturally. I mean, not I really. I don't want to sound not like, like not that you hate. No, you're not. You're not being a prude or anything. But I never, I had never thought of it from that, I guess, perspective. Yeah, I don't know. It's always just, it, it's less about like the Christian mom. Like you can't listen to that record because she talks about alcohol. But like she, ta- it seems like she's talking about being drunk a lot. <laughs> it's like, dude, you, no pun intended. I feel like you might need to calm down <laughs> with that. <shit. laughs> like, I don't know. It just, it seemed like there was. It was overrepresented in this album, but like again, I'm the weird one. I understand most people don't care. It just it stuck out to me more so than ever before, I guess. I picture someday when the show is bigger and we have a producer in the corner listening to us talk while we're in the same room and not in different time zones. And you would have said she needs to calm down, and I would have looked over and we would have said that third person's name, and he would have played a sound effect like dun, 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 poor, or something. <laughs> Uh, maybe someday, dare to dream. But for now, I'll just say that had if if the budget was there, we should have addressed that sonically <laughs> or something. But <laughs> all right, so I noticed she does do a lot more talking stuff in this album, and I know that you always talk about you hated the way she said, "Oh, it's so fun" at the end of "Stay, Stay, Stay." So, what are your thoughts well, on a lot of talking? That isn't my full this? quote. My full quote was that she had deserved doing it, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. Right. It's kind of like in the Simpsons movie when Green Day's like, okay, we played for three straight hours without taking a break. Can we take two and a half minutes to talk about the environment? And they start booing and they sink the barge they're playing on with all the trash they throw at them. So I think artists can earn doing certain things. So that was my stance on that particular stay, stay, stay thing. Yeah. Some of the, it's interesting because that in my feelings challenge and the Drake reference and stuff was something that anyone with an online presence in 2018 wouldn't have been able to escape. So I think she's definitely allowed to reference it. I'm just not sure how much it fit. I don't know. She's never done anything really like that, right? right. I mean, like been like, um, here's the best way I can describe it. Like there was a comedian on uh, last comic standing season two or three seasons ago. And she was kind of like uh, emo Phillips in a way. She was like kind of a little like in her own little world. And then she made a Kardashian joke at the one of her sets in one of the final rounds. And Nora McDonald came in and his criticism was, I mean, you didn't tell a bad Kardashian joke, but that's not the world you live in. You don't have to like, that isn't your style. Yeah, uh, Some of the Drake stuff and tequila stuff just felt like Taylor had created this world for herself. And specifically with Lover, with the framework of what we were led to believe this colorful explosion of love was going to be. Like, it didn't quite fit, I guess. I don't know. Like, um, yeah, I guess I keep coming back to the, the, the word scatterbrain. Like, there was just a lot of thoughts, and she's in a good place, and they ended up in this album. It's a very lovely album. The singles were a little odd. I think half the songs don't do it for me. Half of them are great. And uh, I, guess, I don't know. Um, I guess my final take is, I guess history will decide later if it's distinctly better than rep- reputation. But I guess my main takeaway was 
let's not be so fast to judge all that, I guess. Yeah, and that's why I kind of wanted to take our time with this album. You know, I, I posted this video of like when I just finished listening to the album and I looked at the camera and I was like, well, you know, that's the album. I would give my thoughts, but uh, two things. First of all, it's too soon. And second of all, no one gives a shit, <laughs> you know, and then just like. Well, if it does it for you, it does it for you. I will say this. I mean, and we have a piece that we might toss up on the website soon about Ed Sheeran's latest record, how it's just a bunch of collaborations, you know, with people are writing songs differently because of streaming music services. I think albums have looked different for a while now in the iTunes library era, right? Is it, you know, Stone Age thinking to criticize her for having a song called Lover that sounds nothing like the rest of the music on the record? Or is that just wise to put your best collection of songs, whether they're totally the same or a complete idea the way they are? in 2019 like is it would it be foolish to try to you know but you know i don't know i don't know the answer to that question um but i think there are still people like her fan base is so large there are still people that would want to enjoy the record front to back i just think it's a little jarring to do so given how different they all are like it's weird because you need to calm down might be the catchiest song she's ever written it's just yeah the the clap back internet culture stuff that the lyrics try to paint. It, obviously, it's not a bad message. It'd be much more uproar had she advocated for making fun of people online. You know what I mean? Like, obviously, she's on the right side of that. It just came off. People didn't seem to like it, right? Is that what the vibe you got? Like, it? I don't know. I think that's what certain media outlets tried to portray, but I think the song was generally well-received by both her fans and by the LGBTQ plus community. Some people tried to, like, criticize her for queer baiting, but... I think that was probably coming from largely white men media outlets, <laughs> you know? I mean, it was probably the catchiest song she's ever written, I would have to say. It's a good one. I've listened to it a lot. And I guess, um, what's the... The song, is, oh, uh, Shake It Off or um, Look What You Made Me Do were like her last two most recently catchy. Maybe not Look What You Made Me Do, but definitely Shake It Off. But this is... It's, it's weird how kind of instantly it had a skid mark might be a really wrong term for it, but <laughs> it seems like it didn't have a chance to be one of her best songs off the record. Um, I guess tweet at us at underscore reminiscent FM if you disagree, because it is catchy as hell. I'm curious what everyone thinks about it instead of reading, you know, a spin magazine headline or something, you know, or it might not, not have been spin, not to throw them under the bus, but you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I just think even still, it's too soon to give a critical look at the album, like you said, because everything is so different. It almost feels like in vain to judge the album as a whole. Like it almost needs to be broken down into individual songs. That's not really the show that we do. We're already kind of out of our element, but we do love Taylor Swift, so we will do it. Yeah, um, usually we've had more than a decade, possibly two decades to look right. at some of the stuff we talk about. Like. <laughs> All right, it's been 25 years. We can finally talk about the I'm Not Okay music video by My Chemical Romance. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm fully prepared. I've seen it 75 times, so um, we, can, <laughs> well, <laughs> we can talk about how uh, he gets head in the bathroom if we want. Um, yeah, because we had a couple conversations about, like, do we want to optimize for SEO in getting there while it's still super hot, or do we want to take our time and actually do a proper episode about it and we tried to like find something in the middle but i would love to do this episode six months from now well what's weird nowadays like we did an episode on you know it's, you know we're gonna go back to the throwback stuff over the next few weeks uh we've got some 10-year reunions coming up of things that came out in 2009 um that we're gonna try to hit moving forward and kind of get back into the back in the saddle yeah that's an aerosmith lyric i think that's that's one of the things people say but um yeah, so it's speaking on something still so fresh, but I will say, I don't think it's, I don't think it makes her tier one, which I think sits with two records on top, and that's Red in 1989. Maybe early career fans will disagree wholeheartedly, uh, and they're free; they're more than welcome to. I don't know if I don't know if you would agree with that assessment or not, but um, yeah, I think it's okay. I think it's a good record. I don't think it's her best, but I think in 2019, you're not going to get a ton of artists that are willing to not make the singles sound like the way the single should sound to somebody who's not familiar with the album in an effort to make the album sound alike. I think you're going to get what Sheeran did over the summer, which was 
get just an absurdly talented group of artists to collaborate with him and have almost a cover album's worth of single tracks that could hit the radio at any given time on their own merit, you know, regardless, with almost no desire for the album itself to succeed as a whole pie together. They're just individual slices that, you know, it's, you know, and that's fine. That's fine. You know, it, it, you, somebody was talking about the new Jonas Brothers song, a sucker for you and it's not new anymore it's like a year old at this point but um how you get to the the melodies or you get to the hooks quicker and you know just kind of you have a certain amount of seconds the algorithms that spotify has how how often do people skip before they get to hear what the song's kind of going to be and uh it's changing and i think we see that a little bit with how different this album tends to sound um from track to track but i, I don't I guess i don't have too much of a problem with it i just don't think it's one of her best albums kind of because of that back to the scatterbrain thing that's kind of my final take i think no that that is a good point about the album as a whole and how long you know if you imagine you have someone's attention for only 20 seconds do you have to get to the point as fast as possible do you have to mix it up as fast as possible to keep people guessing because like again we come from the world of like or i do i come from the world of pop punk where it's like nine songs that are all out and then maybe track seven or eight is going to be a slow acoustic one but it's like pretty much the same speed throughout and that's neither good or bad or it's either depending on who you ask but i think that this album might just stand out from like the world that i specifically have lived in so it seems scatterbrained but to someone who listens to pop albums maybe this seems exactly how it should um, the one thing, actually the three things I'll mention real quick before we can wrap it up. First of all, my biggest concern is that it sounds like there's like horrible digital distortion all the way through this album. If you listen to parts where there's a lot of harmonies, there's a lot of vocal things. It sounds like it's all clipping and I'm wondering what the f happened, but at I don't know. It's just, it's bad. Like I, I think that the recording quality as a whole is good, but something went wrong in the mastering and it's clipping like crazy. And it's just really, really bad. Um, I do love how much she, she says the word. Yeah. Like I could listen to an entire album of her just saying, yeah, <laughs> like I fucking love it. I wish she would do it more and more and more. Would you listen to the ASMR vocals only version of this album then? Is that what you're admitting? Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Only except the one song that would still have something else would be um, the saxophone in <laughs> False God. <laughs> so just good. Just the saxophone. Not even the lyrics, just that track would have yeah. just the saxophone part. <laughs> I like, I want to make love in like slow motion on like a CRTV in like 480p. Like that's what that song makes me think of. Like an old like 70s movie love scene <laughs> you know like mm. everything's yes, a little okay. fuzzy um it's good stuff and then this the last <laughs> thing that i do want to say the camera is, looks off into a distant candle and it's really only a circle of kind of flickering light you can't even see the flame <laughs> make it all fuzzy and then the last we thing i want to say is that i contributed to eight of these album sales because I ordered all four deluxe edition albums from target.com and it said it would be here on Friday. And I was like, Oh, shit, next day shipping. That's great. It'll be here for release day. And then I got a notification that was like only eight more days. And I was like, shit, it's going to be here the week after release day. So then on release day, I went down to target as soon as I opened and bought the four versions because I wanted all 120 pages of her diary <laughs> scans. So then later the other four albums came in the mail and I just owned eight Taylor Swift CDs when I don't even think I own a CD player, <laughs> 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 but it was a very fun launch era. I I've never been as involved as I was in this one. And it was like a really, really awesome community experience. And I feel like it taught me a lot about like, community marketing and like the whole like tribe thing you know it was just it was a lot yeah, of fun to I be feel a that. part of this so. is only related in terms of like actions but i think i've mentioned on the show that i'm a fan of the cleveland browns or whatever but it seems like fans now that week one of the nfl is here they kind of are sad in a way because this is what we've looked forward to but really it's been fun getting hyped up and kind of learning about the players and the team and getting excited but now that it's here it's like 
oh crap, I forgot we had to do this part. Now we're all nervous and don't want that part to happen almost in, a, in like <laughs> the weirdest way, even though it's the only thing we've been looking forward to as fans. Right. But really the buildup has been the most fun part almost. So it's, it's definitely kind of a, a weird, but I get what you're trying to say. Like, it's kind of weird how that it, it, it works like that. But, but you know, now the tour is going to come out. Everyone's going to be wondering what the costumes are, who the guests are, the set list. It, you know, things are going to get more exciting and there's going to be live performances. So it's good. It's just, it almost feels like it's here. What do we do now? But I'm stoked. I'm stoked to spend more time with it. Again, I wish we could have done this episode six months out. It wouldn't have made sense then, but I think that's probably how much time this record is going to take to fully digest every bit of it. It's going to take a while. Right. What's coming up next? I mean, there's going to be a Blink album next month that we'll probably talk about. Or we'll pick a week to talk about that and whatever Angels and Airways music is coming out. Um, but in the meantime, are there any specific episodes that we want to tease moving forward or just that if you feel up for subscribing and seeing what's coming up next, we're definitely going to get back to the throwback stuff that we have been doing all along, right? Is that is that the, is that the, what is, uh, oh, is that uh, going to be what, like, um, uh, coming up? Is that kind of what we're going to go for? Well said, Pat. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, we had a couple months off to try to refocus and we're not going to change the show. I think we're just going to be working harder to do the best version of it. We were pretty self-indulgent for the last month, knowing we we're going to take some time. We obviously had a lot of like life changes. I think we might get indulgent next week and kind of talk about what's happened in the past three months. Cause it's been a lot. I'm not sure, but then from there on, we're going to be doing like, you know, the throwback stuff and really get to like the heart of what the show is. I don't think we have anything specific now, but there are quite a few 10 and 10 year anniversaries coming up, even some 15. So we'll be, diving back into the songs of old, the classic pop punk records you all know and love. If you have any recommendations, you definitely can tweet at us at underscore reminiscent FM. That's where we kind of like everyone to go and chat with us. So if there's anything you want to hear, uh, we'll, we'll try to do it. We're making our master list of things to talk about and trying to connect yeah, them 2020 to should be fun because time. we'll be, you know, kind of like against all logic I mean, obviously not logic because the numbers, it would be with all logic, but it'll be crazy to think about that in 2020, we'll hit the 20 year anniversary of a lot of those albums that we hit in junior high and everything. So um, it's going to get real fun in January, but until then we have some 10 year anniversaries of records that came out in 09, stuff like that. And we'll do some, some stuff that we've been wanting to do for a little while now and it'll be fun. And summer was nice. I moved, I live in North Carolina now and Tom is a businessman who runs his own stuff, which is how we left him. But, you know, you've been on a little bit of a journey. Yeah. Which either yeah. we're talking about next week or right now. I'm, I forget. <laughs> Probably more next week. But yeah, things have definitely shifted in my business a little bit. It's been super exciting. And now I'm focusing on more video content, becoming an educator and influencer, developing these courses more. And went to some conferences, made some friends, uh, currently tweeting at Destin from smarter every day, which some of you might know his YouTube channel. It's one of the biggest educational YouTube channels on YouTube. going to see if I can start doing some work for him and his podcast. So things are exciting. Um, I'm really excited for the future of this show because you recently got out of journalism. So it seems like that conflict of interest of like, writing for the website and also writing for your company has been alleviated a bit. So we can really like start upping our con Ugh, sounds so dumb content creation. Yeah. For I don't the know show. if we have to talk about all that. Just like, we're going to, we're going to open it up a little bit and be more active on. I, I don't even know how to, we want to say it. Um, but I, yeah, I, we're definitely going to be writing more for the site and kind of being a little more, we, how do we say that without sounding like we weren't trying before? No, I mean, that's absolutely, um, we're just going to kind of try more like the show. We've always put a lot, I mean, a moderate amount of effort into the show, but when we made the decision to come back, I said that like, I'd rather do kind of all or nothing. So we're kind of going towards more towards all. So more effort into yeah, the show, more towards a, more content. a legitimately self-functioning music blog that, uh, 
and pod. So appreciating the music of the uh, the glorious. Are those the aughts or are the aughts 11 through 20? Uh, either I way, think... to hell with it. The 2000s. <laughs> um, we're going to we're going, you know, we're going to get back to it and it'll be fun. Uh, and I'm excited to catch up next week with everything we've missed. Also, we're 20,000 words deep into the sequel to Ron Carnage. Oh, yeah. Which, um, the first book, Ron Carnage, Thinker Boys, available for purchase on Amazon. Um, and that's been fun as well. We've been not totally sitting on our hands this summer, but uh, it's good to be back. I got to say, I, we haven't talked in a long time. It's been nice to kind of catch up last night and today, getting back into the swing of things. And the Taylor record was okay, and that's okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just going to get better with time, for sure. Yeah, there you go. Like a nicely aged wine, which we all know now that Taylor is so fond of. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, man, she's 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 past the legal age in all states to to imbibe uh, as she pleases. So, <laughs> and she is choosing to, and that's perfectly okay. Well, uh, you want to give a song of the week, and we'll get out of here. John, John, John. Do do do. Yes, as is tradition, you go ahead and go first while I try to remember <laughs> what I've listened to all summer. All right. Just like two days ago, I think Counterparts, which is a melodic hardcore band, released a new single called Wings of Nightmares. It's off their upcoming album, Nothing Left to Love, which will be releasing November 1st. I'm going to try really hard to get their producer either on the show or to interview him for the blog. He's done a lot of work that I've listened to in the past. But the song Wings of Nightmare, dude, they really hit the crippling depression stuff just how i like it so um it's a good song excellent um and we have this i had mentioned that we're going to have a little piece up on the blog shortly about ed sheeran but um mostly it was a song of charlie bliss i think when i left you i was listening to their uh, most recent record charlie xcx came out with some music um, but my song of the week is Blow by Ed Sheeran featuring Chris Stapleton and Bruno Mars. Uh, uh, we, we're going to put something up on the website about it. Um, I think it's good, but mostly it sounds a lot like a Jackson Maine song from the movie Star is Born. And that leaves me conflicted a bit because one is in a fictional world, one's <laughs> not, and how seriously are you supposed to take it and all that stuff. But um, yes, I think my point there is that... I like it, but it's also strange. The whole streaming era type stuff uh, leaves leaves fans confused a little bit. But that's my song of the week, uh, and I have a stockpile that I'll be... Instead of giving them all at once, I'll save my next one for next week, of course, and try to play along. All right. Sounds good. All right, man. Well, I shall talk to you later. I love you, man. It's good to be back. Um, glad everyone stuck with us throughout the uh, throughout the break, and... We'll see you next week. Love you, man. I love you too, man. See you next week. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for sticking around during that super long summer break. And thank you for making it all the way to the end of the episode. I honestly cannot wait to talk about this album over the past couple weeks. And I'm really excited to spend the next few months and the cold winter to come with it. Tweet at the show at underscore reminisce and FM and let us know what you thought of this album, how it ranks in all of her albums, and what your three favorite songs were. All right, we will talk to you next week. We love you all. See you.